Hi, my name is Chris Adams, and this presentation is a summary of some of the key points that we've learned from research and clinical observations over the past few years. Personally, this has been very exciting for me as I've had the unique opportunity to correspond with surgeons all around the world on a daily basis and learn from them. This talk combines all the lessons I've learned from that global experience with all of the available research. Now, it wasn't that long ago that we did not have very good options for an irreparable rotator cuff tear, especially in a young patient. We'd talk about debridement and partial repairs, tendon transfers, and even reverse shoulder replacement. Then came the superior capsule reconstruction, and we have to thank and give credit to Teru Mahata from Japan that described the technique in detail and reported on his clinical results in 2013 in the Arthroscopy Journal. We then had a good solution for the irreparable rotator cuff tear. Since that time, there have been over 10,000 SCR cases performed with a tremendous buzz in the news about what Steve Burkhardt calls this biologic reverse. In a broad sense, we have learned that there are three moments in time in which you can significantly affect the outcome of an SCR patient. First, with patient selection, second, with interoperative technique, and third, with postoperative activities. So starting with patient selection. We have found the best indications are for a symptomatic, large, irreparable supraspinatus or supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear with an intact or repairable subscapularis, with a functional deltoid and trapezius, with minimal to no glenohumeral arthritis. But where is the data to support these statements? Some of the members of the BRASS group just published our results of the SCR in 59 of our initial patients, and we found several interesting observations regarding patient selection. First, we found the more arthritis, the worse the clinical outcome. In our study, the overall clinical success rate was about 75%. However, if you stratify by HMATA classification, you can see that when the patient had HMATA stage 1 with no humeral head migration, or even HMATA stage 2 with proximal migration of the humeral head, the success rate was very good. However, when the patient had HMATA stage 3 with adaptive changes to the undersurface of the acromion, the results were mixed. While if the patient had HMATA stage 4 with bone-on-bone glenohumeral arthritis, the results were poor. So we like to think of it like a traffic light. Hamada stage one and two is your green light to proceed with the SCR. Hamada stage three is your caution, and Hamada stage four is your red light, and we do not recommend the SCR in these patients. We also found that the larger the preoperative irreparable tear, the lower the rate of clinical success. Furthermore, in most cases, the subscapularis needs to be intact or repairable for a successful outcome. Pseudoparalysis is not a contraindication and may be reversed, in advanced cutelier stages do not necessarily preclude a good outcome. Now on to the interoperative technique, which has undergone a significant evolution over the past four years. After careful dissection of the rotator cuff to confirm that it cannot be mobilized and repaired, we have to decide what to do with the biceps. Well, in most cases, we have found that the biceps is often gone. If not, we have found that it is either torn or unstable. So you have to decide if you're going to perform a biceps tenodesis or tenotomy. Where as far as the superior labrum is concerned, anecdotally most surgeons are having good clinical success with either debulking or some completely removing the superior labrum to maximize the bone bed for healing of the medial graft to the superior glenoid. We will typically attempt to use three knotless anchors on the glenoid and a standard speed bridge for the greater tuberosity. But again, where is the evidence? Peter Millett was the lead author in this study where we looked at the safety of glenoid anchors for the SCR. Three beef pins were arthroscopically inserted into 12 cadaveric shoulders in the 10, 12, and 2 o'clock positions on the superior glenoid. And we found that all three anchor positions were safe with respect to the suprascapular nerve and glenoid fossa. And this has been arthroscopically confirmed in the lab. This is a right shoulder and the superior anchor is at least 15 millimeters from the suprascapular nerve. We also found that typically all three anchors are rotated posterior on a clock face. This is a left shoulder. Instead of being at 10, 12, and 2, they're often at 11, 12, 30, and 3. So you have to be cognizant of this, especially when placing that anterior superior anchor to make sure that you're low enough to decrease the risk of anterior superior escape. And finally, we found that the superior anchor trajectory was most at risk for glenoid face perforation. So we recommend placing the superior anchor more medial than the anterior and posterior anchors. 
As you can see in this live patient, we have moved the superior anchor position more medial. Not only decrease the chance of glenoid face perforation, but also decrease the chance of converging on the other two anchors. So we know that they're safe, but what about strength? This is a follow-up to our first anatomic study, and Peter Millett again took the lead on this study, and we looked at different fixation techniques at the superior glenoid. And we found that placing three knotless suture tacks in the superior glenoid had very good ultimate load to failure with minimal variation. So very good anatomical and biomechanical data to support three knotless anchors in the superior glenoid. Now on the humeral side, the majority of surgeons are utilizing the standard speed bridge for fixation of the greater tuberosity. However, if the gap on the greater tuberosity in the AP plane is greater than 30 millimeters, we recommend an expanded speed bridge with three anchors along the medial row, just like you do for a large rotator cuff tear. Now is the SCR just a spacer, or does it biomechanically restore the fulcrum back to the glenohumeral joint? So when you see preoperative and postoperative images such as these, is there distalization of the humeral head because of the spacer effect or improved osteokinematics? Well, we have to give credit to Churu Mahata and Tai Li that published this study in AGSM in 2012, which proved that the SCR restored the superior capsular restraint back to normal. But again, is the SCR just a spacer, or does it biomechanically restore the fulcrum back to the glenohumeral joint? This is something that Gus Mazaka and I are studying in his lab at UConn. The answer we found is both, and is largely dependent on arm position when tensioning the graft, which is arguably the most important step in the operation. If the graft is tensioned properly, then it has more of a biologic reverse function, whereas if the graft is tensioned too loose, it has more of a spacer function. And from our own SOS patient reported outcomes data, we have found that most surgeons when measuring the distance between the anchors, if using a dermal allograft, tension the graft in about 30 degrees of abduction. But it's not just the arm position, but also centering the humeral head on the glenoid when doing your measurements. And when the SCR graft is properly tensioned, you will see this reverse trampoline effect with a proximal translational force to the arm. Well, what about side to side sutures? Well, we've talked about posterior every time for stability and augmentation. And as you can see in this video, the posterior rotator cuff can act as a vascular pedicle to aid in the healing process. And now we recommend anterior sutures, or at least anterior lateral sutures. Now we all know the importance of the medial and lateral attachments of the native superior capsule, but we cannot neglect fixing the anterior and posterior aspects as well, so we can reestablish capsular continuity. Now we're all familiar with Teru Mahata's initial clinical results in the SOS data which demonstrates that most patients do very well after an SCR. Well now we have three clinical papers from the United States which just like Mahata's cohort also demonstrate favorable clinical results after an SCR. But what else can we learn from these three papers? All of the authors from the three articles discovered that later patients have better results. So there was a learning curve including improved understanding and technique evolution. But remember, these were our initial patients as the technique was evolving, including the understanding of the importance of optimal glenoid bone bed preparation, transitioning from two to three glenoid anchors, transitioning from knotted to knotless, arm positioning and humeral head position, graft thickness, graft fixation techniques, and anterolateral side-to-side -side sutures, just to name a few. So we went from essentially a 0% success rate prior to the SCR to at least a 75% clinical success rate with the SCR with a lot of evolving variables. Now, as we discussed, we also learned the importance of patient selection. We also learned that we had a higher failure rate with thinner graphs. So we learned that we need to use thicker graphs. And just like most orthopedic procedures, there is a higher rate of radiographic failure than clinical failure. For instance, the brass group radiographic failure rate was 55%. However, only 20 of 59 patients elected to have an MRI. Basically, at one year, we asked all the patients who wants to get an MRI. So you can imagine who stepped forward and got an MRI. So there was clearly a selection bias. Also, it's very difficult to interpret MRIs after a standard rotator cuff repair, let alone adding allograft, which adds another level of complexity in terms of interpreting these MRIs. And also, all the partial tears in this study were considered radiographic failures. That's in addition to patient selection, technique evolution, and rehab, which are all independent variables that could affect radiographic healing. Now, how many people out there arthroscopically fix tears greater than two centimeters? Well, we all remember Ken Yamaguchi and Lisa Gallet's JBGS publication in 2004, 
which demonstrated a 94% radiographic failure rate by ultrasound. Did we stop doing arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs? No, we learned from them. Also, we shouldn't be tempted to disparage dermal allografts either. If you combine the published results of the BRASS group and Hirahara to represent dermal allografts and compare these results to the fasciolata data, you will see that we are comparing two different cohorts of patients. First, there were about three times as many patients who had prior failed rotator cuff repairs in the dermal allograft group than the fasciolata group. Second, if you look at the Hamada classification, there were significantly more Hamada 3s and 4s in the dermal allograft group. So you cannot compare dermal allograft and fasciolata healing rates from these two important factors alone. However, what surprised us was the majority of the failures were on the humeral side and not the glenoid side. Now I know there's others who found most of their tears on the glenoid side, so this is probably technique driven and timing of the tear. However, half of the radiographic failures were still satisfied with their shoulders, which may be what Rafi Merzion calls a biologic tuberoplasty effect. But most importantly, if the graft healed by MRI, then 100% of them were a clinical success. So we've learned that you have to protect the graft, no different than any other orthopedic procedure with allograft. So on to post-operative activities. Now I've presented this slide in the past. This is a canine infraspinatus rotator cuff tear model that was done by Julie Adams and Scott Steinman at the Mayo Clinic. And they were basically looking at four different time points to see what happens to dermal allografts. Time zero, six weeks, three months, and six months. At time zero, the dermal allograft was a collagen sponge. At six weeks, there was already native cellular infiltration into the dermal allograft. At three months, that's where it got really interesting. The dermal allografts were completely disorganized with hyaline degeneration. And then at six months, the dermal allografts had normal tendon structure grossly and histologically. But more interesting was the load to failure testing of these constructs. At time zero in six months, the two extremes of the study, they found 100% of the constructs failed at the attachment sites, both medial and lateral. However, at three months, when the graft was disorganized with hyaline degeneration, they found over 75% of the constructs failed intrasubstance. So we have to protect these grafts. And remember, most of these SCR patients postoperatively often feel much better compared to a standard rotator cuff repair. So they don't self-regulate and protect themselves in the same manner. So we have to talk to them and slow them down. Well, they're often excited and they want to show you how well they're doing, but we highly recommend you talk to your patients about protecting the graft. Otherwise, your patients will send you videos like these. This is a patient of mine who's four months post-op from an SCR, told me how well he's doing swimming laps. So let's end this talk with a proposal. I'd like to present a brand new procedure to you that you've never heard of before. It's called the ACL reconstruction. And in the first month, patients often feel great. So you allow them to have immediate activities. And a lot of them, within a few weeks, already resume their sporting activities, including soccer and football. Then at one year, you say, you know, what? let's follow up on this group and see how they're doing. And most, not all, but most of the patients clinically are doing very well. So then you say to the whole group, who wants to get an MRI? And a small cohort decides, you know what, I'll get an MRI. And you see that the radiographic healing rate is lower than the clinical success rate. Well, at that point in time, do you abandon the procedure? No, you don't abandon the procedure, you learn from it. Now there are significant parallels between an ACL reconstruction and a superior capsule reconstruction. We've learned with the ACL reconstruction, you have to restrict activities. Well, that's no different than what we've learned with the superior capsule reconstruction. We also learned with ACL reconstructions that there's a big difference in healing rates between grafts that are less than or greater than eight millimeters. Well, we also learned with the superior capsule reconstruction, you need to use thicker grafts. In fact, some across the country, including Rafi Merzion, are advocating thicker grafts, maybe even doubling over the graft. And finally, the internal brace, which has gained significant momentum with ACL reconstructions. Instead of having the brace outside the knee, you have it inside the knee. Well, that's no different than what we're seeing with the superior capsule reconstruction. Surgeons from all over the world, including Fernando Barkley and Pablo Narbona from Argentina and Matt Ravenscroft from the United Kingdom have been doing the internal brace for some time now. In fact, Matt Ravenscroft from the United Kingdom, he MRIs every single one of his SCR patients at three months. And what he has found is that when he compares his cohort before the internal brace and after the internal brace, he's had over 20 consecutive patients with 100% healing of their grasp by MRI. Along those lines on the right is a case I did where I added a purse string with suture tape very loosely along the periphery of the graft on the outside of the body, which was easy to do. 
This created a ripstop along all four edges of the graft with a built-in internal brace to protect the graft during the healing phase. And I tested it both intraoperatively and postoperatively, and it did not restrict motion. So just as we still do ACL reconstructions, we will continue to learn and do superior capsule reconstructions. So to summarize, number one, patient selection is important. Number two, the larger the preoperative irreparable tear, the lower the rate of success. Number three, the subscapular should be intact or repairable. Number four, advanced cutaneous stages and pseudoparalysis do not preclude a good outcome. Number five, careful glenoid bone bed preparation is important. Number six, three knotless glenoid anchors are efficacious. Number seven, the speed bridge for the greater tuberosity and an expanded speed bridge if the AP dimension is greater than 30 millimeters. Number eight, proper arm and humeral head positioning and tensioning of the graft is critical. Number nine, thicker dermal allografts. Number 10, protect the graft, whether it's a modified rehab program, a thicker graft, and or an internal brace. Number 11, there was a learning curve. However, number 12, most SER patients do very well and the results are only getting better in the future. Thank you.